question came up regarding renaming views in Revit with prefix, suffix, or find and replace. There are tools that do this, uh, but this was an excellent use case for Dynamo, and it's a graph that I've built before and shown at various user groups and things like that, so I thought I'd make for a cool video to show how to make this from scratch. In my example, I'm in Revit 2020 and Dynamo 2.6, but this should work for any current version of Revit or Dynamo, and you'll be able to build this graph out uh, by the end of this video to be able to build a view renamer. So in short, we want to simulate a selection of views in the project browser. And ideally we could right click and say, add prefix or suffix or find and replace to rename them. That's not doable. So we need to build that interaction out in Dynamo. So I'm just going to fire up Dynamo and click on new to start a new blank workspace. For this workflow, I'm going to use a few custom packages. I'm going to use Clockwork, Spring Nodes, and Monocle. Monocle is just for graph cleanup. Spring Nodes is for collection utilities and Clockwork will be used for setting the name and a few other Revit API interactions that we need to do. So the first thing is we need to figure out how to collect these views from the project browser. Uh, in out of the box Dynamo, there's no way to do this directly, but if we type in current selection after installing spring nodes, we do have an option for that collector. So spring nodes is definitely a package you want to have installed uh, at all times. It should be one of the first ones you install whenever you have Dynamo installed because it has a ton of nodes that help out with all sorts of different things. So we'll go ahead and place this node. We'll notice that the node already ran and that's because we are currently in run automatic. That is the default mode in newer versions of Dynamo and it's fine for this interaction right now. Uh, so as you can see, I've collected six floor plan views. These are Revit elements. I could tell that because they have a green element ID next to them. Uh, you can also check what element type you're dealing with by placing a object type node and observing that as well. So these are Revit elements. That is their base class that they inherit from. Awesome. So we do know that we want to work with the name of these views. So in Dynamo, we can actually navigate to some of these nodes manually. We navigate to the Revit category, the elements category, and the element subcategory of the library we can see all the options available to us. This lightning bolt means that it is an action on the object. So things like delete, setting the location, setting parameters, things like that would appear in this category. Uh, if we want to obtain properties from the element, we could go down to the query category or this question mark and observe those different options for us. If I scroll down, I'll notice that I have a name option. The description of this node is get the name of the element. So we're going to go ahead and place this. This node is unique because it works for all Revit elements and just uses their built-in name property. Uh, some elements in Dynamo or some nodes have options to get room names and things like that. And that's because there are different parameters per element on an element by element basis as well. So let's go ahead and connect these nodes and take a look at what we get. So really quickly, we've obtained the name of the element or the view in our case, and we've gotten that for each one of the views. In order to just make this code a little bit clearer, this graph, we're going to practice grouping as we're working through this. Uh, once again, that interaction is through Monocle, the little eyedropper. If you don't have Monocle installed, you can hit Control G as in group uh, on your keyboard, and you'd get something that looks like this. I tend to use monocle because I like these colors that it defaults to. So we'll go ahead and call this, get the current selection from the browser and the name of the element. That way we know what's going on if we open this graph at a later date or we hand it off to somebody. Now it's probably a good time to go ahead and save our graph as well. So let's go ahead and save. In my case, I have the complete graph on my desktop in a folder called Dynamo Player. I'm just going to overwrite that. You can save this file wherever you want. So the goal here is to make this work with Dynamo Player. So we need to think about a few inputs that we want to offer our end user. A lot of the time, 
the inputs that we'll end up using appear under this input category. The basic category is a good place to start for a lot of these inputs. In our case, we know that we want the user to input text. In Dynamo, text is called a string. Uh, that's the basic definition of it is it's a series of characters. That's what a string is. So we're going to place one of these string nodes. And once again, since we are making this to where it will work in Dynamo Player, uh, I want to add a description to let the end user know what this graph does. So if we right click and we make this an input, we now have a description input for the user to see. This will be editable text, but oftentimes I use these descriptions just to tell them how the graph works. So we'll put something like, this will get the current selection from the project browser and rename according to the criteria below. And we'll put criteria below because we want to add a few more inputs for them to be able to modify. I'll go ahead and group this just as information. That way that's clear and then we'll hit save. Cool. So we do want to offer a few additional inputs for our end user. So we'll go ahead and place another string node. We'll rename this node prefix because I know I want to give people that option. We'll right click and make it an input. And we're going to do a control copy for the next inputs. So I know we want a suffix option as well. And since we did a copy, it's already an input. It's really important in Dynamo Player to do these in the order that you can see yourself wanting because that is how they will sort as inputs on Dynamo Player. So always keep that in mind. If they're out of order, you will have to re-add them in the order you want. And pretty frustrating, but if you know about it, you just know how to account for it. I know that I want to give them the option to find text and replace text as well. So those are our four inputs. And we'll use monocle to clean these nodes up a little bit and I'll group them as an input color coding. So there we go. We'll hit save again. So the easiest way to combine strings or text in dynamo is to use something called a code block. If we double click on our canvas and we type in one or something. Code blocks are interesting because they let you use them in this way. So where you can just output data types. If I were to put text or some double quotes, it converts it to a string. One interesting thing with code blocks is we can also do formulas. So if we type in pre for prefix plus original name for the original name and stuff for suffix, we now have some inputs on this code block. So if we connect these in the way that they seem like they should be, we will get an output. And right offhand, it seems like this code block hasn't done anything. And that's because we haven't fulfilled any inputs. They're just blank. So it's combining blank with the original name. This workflow is nice because it just works. I don't have to do any kind of analysis if someone input something or not and combine them or anything crazy like that. It just, it simply just works. So let's modify the inputs just to see that in action. So now we can see that we have the A and the Z uh, appended and prepended to the original name resulting in our modified name. Uh, so this is working. We are still on run automatic, so it is updating automatically. We'll go ahead and clear those values. We'll hit save again. And now what we want to do is give the person or the end user the option for the replacement with the find and replace. Since we are dealing with string data types, we can navigate to the string category in the library and we want to modify it so there is a modify category. A lot of time that's how you can think this out logically is we want to modify the string or manipulate it so that's the category we'll go to. Once again, the lightning bolt indicates that this is an action on the element. So if we scroll down, we'll see that we have an option for replace and the description of that node is replaces all occurrences of text in a string with other text. That sounds about right, so let's place that node. So now that we have this node placed, we can observe the inputs. We have the string to replace, which would be our modified string, what we're searching for, which would be our find, and what we want to replace with, which would be our replace. 
we will see that we have an error and if we hover on it, it will give us some more information. This node's currently freaking out because our string inputs for find and replace are blank. They're nothing. So they have no length to them. They're a blank character. The out of the box node doesn't like this and there are ways to work around this, but it does throw out an error whenever you try to use it. Uh, some ways that I've worked around this are to use like a really weird character like dollar sign and you would find and replace a dollar sign and it doesn't exist so it does nothing to the string. Uh, that's not great because then your end user needs to know about that. Uh, so we will use another node for this actually. In our case, we're going to go ahead and remove the string replace that's out of the box and we're going to search for string replace in the search on canvas. We will see that we have a few options in here from clockwork. That's the yellow clock, uh, cog icon. And uh, we have one in here called replace multiple. There's also one called replace plus, which is really nice, but it's a little more advanced. In our case, we're going to use the replace multiple node. Uh, we actually aren't going to replace multiple things, but this node has some built in error handling. That's really nice. So we'll plug our string into our modified string. We'll collapse this preview and we'll go ahead and fulfill the other inputs as well. Now we can see that this is simply just running. It's doing what you would expect it to without any errors. Now this is an excellent use case of why sometimes a custom package is a little bit nicer to use. Now Andreas, who builds the clockwork package, did a lot of work for us to make this a really nice node that we can use. So if we do find, I'll find a dash and I'll replace it with dollar signs. You'll see that this is running automatically and it's just working how we would expect it to. So really good node. Uh, it really works well. Uh, what we'll do is we'll also group this. I'll use this as a background logic grouping and we'll say build the new name based on criteria. And you can name these however you want. Just make sure it makes sense for someone to know what it's doing. We'll hit save again. As you can see, nothing's happened in Revit yet, and that's because we haven't pushed these changes back. So in order to do that, we have to set the name of those elements. So oftentimes when I'm thinking about what I want to do uh, within Dynamo, I'll just search it. So if we were to search for set, we'll see that we have a few options in here based on whatever packages you have installed. If I were to say set name, we will have a few more options that are a little more specific. I know that there are a few options in here that we can use. I know that a view is an element. So if I look at this element input, I'll see that this is from the clockwork package. And the description of this node is sets the name of a given Revit element. That sounds about right. So let's go ahead and place that node. We could do this interaction with a set parameter by name node as well, but the element set name is a little more stable. It doesn't use hard coded parameter values. And it actually sets the name based on the Revit API in a different way. It's really nice because um, I noticed I have a misspelling over here. So we'll just fix that right quick. It's really nice because it works throughout all languages and it will work on several elements. That's what's nice about using something that's a actual Revit API interaction instead of the set parameter by name node. In our case, we can see that this takes an element as an input and a string name as an input. Before we connect this node, we want to make sure we change to run manually uh, because if we were to add a prefix to these views, it would keep on adding the prefix in a circular loop until Revit crashes and yeah, that's just not fun. So when we're changing elements in Revit, a lot of the times we'll switch to manual run mode just to be safe. Uh, for what it's worth, that problem is not presented in Dynamo Player, so you won't have an endless loop in Dynamo Player, but when you're on Run Automatic, you can. So just be a little safe with that whenever you are manipulating uh, Revit elements. Awesome, so we are in Run Manual. I'm going to go ahead and hook the name into the name. And the last time I worked with my actual Revit elements is way over here at the beginning where the green element IDs are. So knowing your data types uh, is really important. As you can see, this says element as the output and all of these other nodes are string as the output. If I were to plug the string into the element, it just simply wouldn't work. So just knowing what you're connecting is a good strategy to have. Oftentimes I'll make my nodes that make changes to Revit orange. So that way I could see them really easily if I'm zoomed out. So I'll go ahead and hit save. 
we'll change the prefix just to see this work and we'll hit run. And now we'll see that we have the letter A as a prefix on all of my floor plans that I had selected at the beginning. I'm going to clear the prefix and hit undo once in Revit and hit save on my graph. Uh, so now let's take a look at how this works in Dynamo Player. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and document the custom nodes that I'm using in here. And I use Monocle for that once again. If you go to Package Usage, you can use the Package Usage Doge. Click on that and click on Annotate. And it will automatically add notes to each custom node. Uh, so that way you know what package it came from. This is really nice if someone opens the graph and all these nodes turn red or yellow and they don't know where they came from. They would be able to see, oh, let me install spring nodes and I'll be good to go. So I have a tendency of doing that. And uh, the documentation is nice because it has that prefix of custom node colon. Uh, this is nice because you can actually use that at later dates to analyze all of the graphs on your network for what packages you're using or something like that. So we'll go ahead and hit save. We'll close Dynamo and we'll open Dynamo Player. So I already have my folder mapped, but you would simply navigate to the folder that you saved your graph and they would appear as workflows in Dynamo Player. Uh, since Revit 2018.2, we have the option to edit inputs. So we're going to click that button and it will load the graph for you with all of your inputs. As you can see, we have our description and it tells you how the graph works and then we have all of our input options. Now let's go ahead and pick some different views. So I'll pick these ceiling plans and we'll add a prefix of E for existing maybe. And then we'll hit play. So as you can see, that graph ran really fast. We added that prefix to our ceiling plans and we're good to go. If I needed to add it to a few more, I would simply select a few more views, hit play. And it worked on those views as well. Let's go ahead and use it to do a find and replace real quick, just to see how that works. And we just did a find and replace the E with parentheses with blank on those views. Uh, this workflow is really nice. So if you want to get back to the default view, you hit refresh. This workflow is nice because you can actually use it to rename schedules and all sorts of different things. So we'll do a dash just to make it different. And now we have all those renamed. You can also use it to select a bunch of stuff. So we'll actually select a whole lot of views and I'll add a suffix of dash 100 just for the heck of it. And it will work across those categories. So it's a pretty rigid workflow that shouldn't break for most cases, as long as you use it based on the directions. Interesting enough, if you were to select some families, so if I select these door families, for instance, and hit play, it will work on those types. So this is more than a view renamer, actually. It will rename pretty much anything you can select in the project browser. I actually think it will rename certain things that you select uh, within the project environment as well. It just depends on what you select. So maybe try that out as a next step. It is designed to rename views primarily. So as long as you use it in that way, you will be good to go. And yeah, there it is. That's a graph to rename views from your project browser. The completed graph I'll link below in the description. But if you build it from scratch, just let me know and have fun with it. And yeah, maybe in the future we'll We'll build upon this or something like that. Uh, have fun renaming views and thanks for checking it out.